Goldsmith. I'm with the American Red Cross. I actually uh, am in charge of all of our preparedness and planning um, stuff. And so my job is to go out into the community, to groups like yours, and talk about how you can prepare yourselves um, in your home for a uh, disaster. So um, we do several different types of preparedness. We do a, a kid-based youth program. We have a business-based program. Um, we have the program I'm about to show you here, which is our Be Red Cross Ready, which is sort of a multi-tool ready kind of group. And then our last is, um, we're currently doing a home fire campaign where we're installing smoke alarms into homes that don't have updated or may have expired alarms. So, um, so today we're going to talk about um, in what we call our individual preparedness piece, which is uh, Be Red Cross Ready. Our motto is to get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. Um, well, you'll see as we go through this that it's really, that's kind of the reverse. First we want to inform you so that you can make a plan and then you can gather your kit. So we'll go through those steps today. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the hazards that we experience in our area, some of the questions that you can start asking in your own home and how you can prepare for some of those hazards. What to put, what is a disaster kit? Um, and then what to put inside of it? And I've got an example right here, so we'll go through some of those elements and talk about that. Um, how to make a plan and what types of questions you need to be asking when you create your plan so that you can create one that works for your family. Um, and then be informed. Um, how to find out all the information you need to know about the particular disaster that you're experiencing, where to get help, um, how to find a Red Cross shelter if you need one, things like that. So, the first section is to prepare. So, uh, these are some of the natural disasters that we experience here in um, Colorado. So, forest fire, flood, tornado, blizzard. Um, we basically can experience everything in Colorado except for a hurricane, a tsunami, and we haven't yet experienced a volcanic eruption. Otherwise, we can experience just about everything. Earthquakes happen, thunderstorms, um, all manner of disasters in this area. So um, it's always important to kind of think about the differences between each of those because um, the way you respond to a forest fire situation is going to be different than the way you respond to a flood situation, and etc. So these are some pictures. Uh, the one on the top is uh, our Waldo Canyon fire that we had a couple years ago. The next down there is the Manitou floods that happened on 24, which I'm sure we all remember seeing those YouTube videos. Um, and that's a picture of a tornado that was out east in the Elizabeth area. Um, and of course, we always have our winter storms. So um, I was um, here, I don't know if you guys were all here in 97 when we had that really big blizzard and everyone was snowed in and we had power outages. And, um, all kinds of stuff from that. So, um, so the thing that we respond to the most often is our single-family and multi-family house fires. We respond to a single-family house fire every nine minutes across the nation. So this is actually way more common and more likely to affect you in your home than any of those large-scale black forest, smaller canyon type events, even across the whole nation, tornadoes, all of that stuff. So we really emphasize um, in all of our preparedness that you are home fire prepared. Um, because there's a lot of differences between when your own house goes up in flames versus a wildfire and an evacuation and all that kind of thing. Um, so we call them single family or multi-family. So multi-family would be a townhome, an apartment complex, things like that that can um, affect more than one home. Sometimes, especially in those situations, your home may not have actually had any flame damage, but it might have smoke damage, it might have um, you know, pipes that burst, things like that, that are affected by what happened in a different compartment of the building. So, um, and then we also do technological and accidental hazards. So that's uh, we had a train accident up in Monument a few years back, where there was a chemical spill and we had to evacuate an area. Um, there's all kinds of semis that come through I-25 that have all types of um, waste and things like that that might not um, be safe if they were to get out, and so if there's a car accident, that's the situation we deal with. Um, in chemical leaks, down in Pueblo, they have some um, facilities that if there were to be a leak, we would have to evacuate. So the second section is our get a kit. Um, so the first question that you want to ask is what time container is going to work best? Um, so I have a backpack here, and it's um, waterproof, and it's durable, and it's portable. Um, so it's, it's kind of our favorite go-to. Um, so it's the best way to kind of get all of your things together. And um, what I've included in the kit here is um, a couple of, I've laid out a couple of different items and you're welcome to, you know, go through this and kind of look at what's in here. Um, but we have a first aid kit over here. Um, pictures of your family members and your pets or anything that's in the house. Um, 
that you know maybe if you're in a situation where you have to get out quickly, um, this is a way that you can identify who who belongs in your household if you're trying to locate them and find them. Um, and that way you've got this picture, so you can put a picture of your dog in the Humane Society as an identifying factor. Um, duct tape is something we always, always say you should have. Duct tape um, can fix so many different problems. Um, and then I laid this out. This is for our, um, this is a poncho, but when you're thinking about what you put into your kit, you definitely want to make sure that whatever is in here is um, seasonal. So, you know, right, right now you probably don't really need a poncho in your kit. But you might want to put some type of warm blanket, something um, insulating that you can put inside the kit for the cold weather type response. Um, and then also, we recommend that you pack um, at least a month worth of your meds inside your kit if you possibly can. Um, and not just yours, but your pets as well. So that's the blue container there. Um, just in case um, you know, you're out of your home for two or three or four days, you need to be able to do that. Or longer. Um, another thing that uh, was really cool that somebody mentioned to me is um, putting in, once you go for your new eye exam, you get a new set of glasses, put that old set inside of your kit, and then you don't have to pay for an additional set of glasses just for emergency. But you have a set of glasses if you absolutely need them. Um, this right here is, uh, is our fanciest type, but this is a hand cranked radio, and it is also a cell phone charger and, um, and a flashlight all kind of combined into one and it's hand cranks. So you don't need any electricity for this. Um, so that is super, super handy. They have smaller versions that are just radios or just flashlights or just um, cell phone chargers, but that's all uh, really helpful. They also have um, solar power cell phone chargers, so um, if you want to grab something like that, you can do that as well. So um, there's also water included in the kit. Um, normally what we recommend is, and I believe this is on a slide coming up, is that you have a gallon of water per day for every person in your household. And that is a ton of water to take with you. So I have a family of five um, in my home right now, and that would be 15 gallons of water. And that doesn't, that's just for eating and drinking. That's not for like washing your face, brushing your teeth, trying to clean up a little bit. So, um, and it doesn't include anything for my pets either. So really, I'm looking at the vicinity of like 25 gallons of water. And how are you going to get 25 gallons of water into a kit like this? And then try to lug all that out in an emergency situation. Um, so what we recommend is if you're in a shelter in place situation, you have two options. You can go into the tank of your toilet, and that water is fresh and clean and sanitary. Or um, there's a valve that you can shut off as the intake valve for your, um, for your water heater. And then there's a spigot at the bottom of your water heater, so you have 55 gallons-ish um, of fresh clean water that you can pull out of your water heater. So that's a way to sort of accommodate those water needs without having to actually store water. Uh, what I usually recommend is that people put a case or two of water in the trunk of their car just in case, um, and then maybe a couple of uh, bottles of water inside a bag like this. Or if you have a camel bag, that's a really great way to just fill up the water and use that. Um, you can also, instead of packing all of that fresh clean water, pack something just to carry the water in, and then bring some iodine with you, which you can get a really small thing of that. So it's more um, compact and easy to take with you. Um, and then you just use that to sanitize whatever water source you're able to find. So maybe you have to go to 7-Eleven or something to, to fill up your Camelback flyer, but you can put that iodine in there, it'll sanitize the water to make it drink. Um, so we recommend that you store the kit near an exit point. Um, so that would be, like for us, our, our kit is um, inside our coat closet just by the front door. So that way, as you're going out the door, that's something really fast that you can grab and send with you. Um, and there are six basic categories of stuff, which I kind of went over just now. So food, we would suggest you have 72 hours of non perishable food. Um, that's about two meals per day per person in your home. Um, food doesn't have to take up as much room as those cans are there. This right here will feed a family of four for five days. It has enough calories and protein in it to keep them to keep them filled and keep the right amount of calories. In what them. age kids? For huh? What age of kids? Um, you know what? I think that it has to be. You can't be like infants. They have to have a full set of teeth in order to use it. So it's like I believe it's like a um, like granola bar type stuff in it. 
So, um, <coughs> and how many days will that be? This will be the family of four for five days. No way. Yeah. I have teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> they may have to cut back a little bit on their hunger pains. But the nice thing is, is you can buy multiples of these and stick them in the bag. And this is not nearly as tedious as grabbing a whole bag full of canned goods. So that's not perishable? No, yeah, this is not perishable. Um, and you can get all kinds of survival food like this at REI or any type of hiking store where they do like long term. Where do you get that? Stuff. This particular one um, actually comes with a kit that we have on the American Red Cross website, so I'm not sure where they contract that from. But this type of stuff is available all <coughs> over the place. Yeah, right. you can. Uh, that's another great way to do it. Uh, they but also you're not have fit five days in a little package like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you might. You might you know, one of these for every meal <laughs> for those boys. <laughs> but um, but it is an option. So so when you think about what kind of food that you want to put into that kit, it doesn't have to be bulky, heavy uh, food. And the goal is to make it as again as compact and portable as possible. So there's a lot of options. Um, so of course, water. We said 72 hours of water, one gallon per day per person, um, and that can add up really fast. So. Um, just kind of, and the other thing to be aware of too is if you do put a bottle of water in your kit, water can go stale, so you want to kind of rotate that water out. So, um, what I like to do is, you know, I'll go to Costco and buy a big bulk thing of water, and then um, I usually put, like I said, about two cases in my car and a couple bottles in each of my go kits. Um, and then every time I change my smoke alarm battery, I go in and I change my water out. And then I'll send those bottles of water that we didn't use with my children to school for the day so that they, we can kind of get rid of it and it wasn't a waste. Um, always recommend that you have a first aid kit. Of course, Red Cross has them, but you can get them just about anywhere. A lot of the stuff in a first aid kit you can actually get um, just around your house. You don't really need to buy a specific kit for that. So grab some band-aids, grab some antiseptic wipes, things like that, and, and put them all together. Um, this is clothing and bedding. Again, we want to make sure it's seasonal, and I don't recommend you get anything bulky, like the blankets that they're showing in the picture of the jacket. Um, that's just not, not feasible to take with you. So they have those insulating um, blankets that you can wear that kind of look like foil. You might have seen like marathon runners use them with the end of that race. Um, and they're really compact and they pack in just as small as that little poncho bag. So things like that that can help you um, sort of... Space blankets, what they call them. Yeah, space blankets, that's right, you're right. right. And they look like aluminum foil. Yeah, they something. look like yeah. you're wrapping yourself up in foil, but they're, apparently they're phenomenal for warmth and, and that kind of thing, so it's really cool. Um, so duct tape, flashlight, uh, don't forget batteries. If um, you can, we, we found the battery set um, that came with the flashlight. So we know this, this kit is complete because the batteries can't have been used. But if you buy just the flashlight, make sure to throw in an extra pack of batteries in there. Um, or if you have the hand cranked um, that has the flashlight on it. Um, something like that is a good idea. Um, and then some basic tools, you know, a Phillips and a flathead because you just never know what you're going to need. Sometimes you can buy those in a small kit as well that it's easy to stick in the bag. Um, so there's an example of the smaller hand cranked phone charger. Actually, I should just use this right there. And then um, hard copy maps because sometimes the cell phone service will go down in your area during a disaster because the first responders need to use that phone line. And so they block all the other calls so that first response can um, communicate. So having a hard copy of the map of your area um, or surrounding areas is always a good idea as a backup plan. Um, we also recommend a set of meds, um, glasses, hearing aids, um, and a copy of your prescription if you can. Um, it's a really great way to get yourself accommodated for those things if you need them and you weren't able to bring them with you and you don't have an extra in your kit. Um, so, any type of identification is a good thing to have with you. Um, passport, social security card, um, cash, and this bottom one over here in the corner is your, oops, sorry, is your insurance policy. Um, so that's something that people kind of forget about, but you can make copies of what you have, and then it also includes the contact information if you need to get in touch with your insurance agent for, you know, uh, for accommodations. There are types of homeowners insurance that cover displacement. 
So even if your home hasn't been marked as damaged or destroyed, you still want to be in touch with your insurance agency. So that's important information. As um, a Red Cross there, if you come to one of our shelters, we'll need proof of address <coughs> from you. So you can take an old um, utility bill and stick it in your um, in your bag, and um, that will count as proof of address. Um, in terms of cash, um, they do recommend that you have like a thousand dollars in cash inside your go kit. I think that's a little exorbitant. <laughs> I don't think that's practical, and I don't think it's a safe idea to have a thousand dollars in cash just sitting in a backpack. Not not so <laughs> I don't that love it. Yeah, I don't love that, but. Um, the idea is if the ATMs go down and et cetera, et cetera, you have some way of putting gas in your car, if you need to get a hotel room, things like that. Um, cash is pretty universally accepted everywhere and it gets you some of the things that you might need if, if you're in a situation. So be thinking about what's practical for you and what you think is really necessary versus what maybe um, is a little over the top. <laughs> um, so we definitely want to touch on pets a little bit. Um, make sure that you have food, water, crate, leash, identification, and vet records for all of your animals in your home, if possible. Um, and then be thinking about where you're going to take your pets. So in most Red Cross shelters, we don't have a way to accept pets. We did recently start um, working with the Humane Society, so they have sort of a separate portion of our shelter where they can house animals if the building that we're using will allow it. So for instance, we'll open a shelter up in a school, we open up in churches, we open up in YMCA's. If, the, if that building is okay with having pets in their building, then we can do that, but sometimes they're not. So it's important to maybe have a plan. Um, one of the options that people used often during Black Forest Fire was um, calling their vet. And the vet usually has a, the ability to house a handful of animals and so they could take one or two of their customers or clients' animals um, and house them for a few days. Um, if you have a friend or a family member that lives you know, out of the evacuation zone that you might be able to drop your pets off at their house for a while, things like that, just kind of be asking those questions and thinking about what you would do if you had to leave your home with your gerbil and your kitty cat and all that stuff. Um, and then we also touch on livestock. I don't know if anybody in this room has any. Do you? Okay. So um, again, whatever you need in order to lead the animal out of the property, identification and vet records. I'm sure you guys probably saw them spray painting their phone number on the side of horses last year. Duct tape. Um, yeah, or duct tape, and then or any information on that. Um, that I mean, that's one way to do it. <laughs> but um, if you're prepared, then you can say, okay, I, you know, I knew this might happen, and so I talked with my neighbor. They have a horse trailer they can bring over. We're going to get our animals out of here. And then you know exactly where your pets are going, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, so that kind of stuff is um, helpful to keep you from having to just do that, where you open up the doors and slap them on the butt and send them out. So, um, we also have CART. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's the County Animal Rest Response Team. Um, they're great in a single family house fire situation. They can come out and help you get your animals off the property if you need to. However, when you're talking about a large scale response, they're responding to everybody. So Black Forest, that was really a problem and it just didn't have the manpower to help. So it's always good to have a plan B with that. Um, if you know of any animal associations that you're a part of, some type of 4-H connection, or like Penrose Norris Event Center, house a lot of animals, certainly Black Forest Fire. Yeah, so you know, just making sure that you know who to call and, and where you can go and kind of get creative um, and make a list, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C, as many as many plans as you have to sort of um, accommodate all of your um, livestock. Um, so this is another resource that we have. Um, if you have a smartphone, I encourage you to check out these apps. Um, there's a lot of little apps in this picture. Um, if you go to redcross.org slash prepare, and that's our website, um, you can get all the links. It'll, you type in your phone number on the website, and it'll send you a text message to download the app. I don't think that you can get these apps in the Play Store. Um, but they're really cool. Each one of them addresses a different topic. And the slide is on. OK. Um, so we have, a, we have a, an app for tornadoes. We have an app for wildfires. We have an app for um, floods. So you can get a different app for every different type of disaster that you feel like is going to affect your area. And the reason we divide them out is because 
There's a couple things that these apps do. The first thing is that they'll warn you if your area is under duress for that particular um, problem. So maybe it's a tornado siren, or um, you know, if there's an evacuation and your address is included in that. Um, and also, you can program the app to, to your address <coughs> so that if you're at work, and your home is affected, you'll still get that notification. You don't have to be um, GPS on property to get that notification. You can also click a button that tells you if your area, maybe you're at work and um, that's being evacuated, but your home is fine, you can get a, a notification for that. And then it'll talk you through all the steps that you should take before, during, and after that type of disaster. So um, we have an example right here. Um, Create your own emergency preparedness kit. So this is something that you'll see on our website, but it's also in one of our apps. And you plug in over here the number of adults in your home, the number of children in your home, the number of pets in your home, um, and anything else you want to include, livestock, or et cetera. Um, and then you click calculate, and it will tell you that in this case, this person needs one flashlight, uh, one gallon of water, et cetera, et cetera. And it will tell you exactly how much you should consider putting together so that you sort of have a checklist. Um, of all of the essentials. And you can always build on that, you can always take away from it if you feel like some of it's unnecessary, but it's a great starting point. It's a great way for you to get going in that. Um, and then down here we have a link to our website where you can purchase some of the preparedness items that we already have. So if you're unsure how to get a hold of some of that stuff, you can check there. You can price match it, you can you know, look at some of the suggestions for how to accommodate that need and then maybe you know, check Amazon or eBay or whatever. Um, so, um, so that information is at the bottom of the web page. And again, it's all also on every single one of those apps. Um, we also have apps that give you information on CPR and first aid, um, pet first aid, wilderness first aid, things like that. So if you're in a situation where you need to know how to take care of yourself, maybe you broke down on the side of the road on I-70, um, and you might be there for a while, we have an app that will help you kind of walk through what your first step should be and how to take care of yourself until um, help can can arrive. Um, in a recent survey that we did, 70% of people believed that first response would get to them before they needed to prepare themselves. Um, and that's just kind of a common misconception. The, the problem is when it's a large scale disaster, um, first response really can only get to about 20% of um, who they're trying to help in that area within the first 24 hours. So it's really important that you have a couple of days worth of, of help for yourself um, so that you can take care of yourself and your household if they can't get to you just yet. So, <coughs> the make plan. So, we want you to talk this over with your family and with your house. Um, where do you start? The three W's is what can happen in your area, where you should go, and who you should contact. So, we recommend that you have two different meet-up places. One of them in your, within your neighborhood, so maybe that's just across the street at the mailbox. Uh, maybe that's down the street at a neighbor's house that you trust. Um, but outside of your neighborhood is a really important <coughs> one. Um, recently there was, so we've had a couple different situations. There's the Boston bombings um, where, you know, we have wife and daughter watching husband run and he's kind of way down here and they're way over here and they're across the city and they don't know how to connect with one another and no one even knows if they're safe and okay. Um, I had a situation with, um, I was in an active shooter situation when I was a little bit younger and um, got separated from my family and didn't know how to find them. And it was, I mean, that adds a whole other level of panic to what you're experiencing. So um, it's always important to have that outside area. So for my family, there's a Panera Bread that's about two miles away. So if my kids are at school, my husband's at work, I'm at work, and we have to evacuate our home and nobody's there. Um, my husband is the one that's going to go home and gather up what he needs, and then we're, I'm responsible for going to Panera Bread to meet my family in Panera Bread. So, um, so that's kind of one way to do it. So just be thinking about that. How are you guys going to reconnect with one another if there's a situation where you have to evacuate? Um, we also have these emergency contact cards right here. I don't have any with me today, um, but I can send a template via email if you're interested. And it just asks for your name, your phone number, and your address. But then on the back side, it'll ask for a second contact. Um, because we also want you to think about who you're supposed to get in touch with. So um, number one is um, send a text message. Don't, don't try to phone. Um, SMS text messaging sends faster and is more... Um, 
streamlined and it keeps everybody off of the phones so that those first responders can use the phone towers. Um, so text messaging is the best way to get in touch with everybody. Um, but again, sometimes even that text message won't send for a couple hours after you push the send button. So um, we always recommend that you have an out-of-state contact number. It's easier to use an area code that's out-of-state and reach outside of our boundaries and tap some of those towers that are maybe in Kansas or Nebraska to try to get to your family. So I have a relative in Southern California that we're all supposed to call and let them know that we're okay. And that way, if my kids call that person and say they're okay, and I still haven't connected with them, and I call that person, they can relay that message to me. Oh, your kids called a few minutes ago, they're fine, and they're at the school, or et cetera. Um, so having an out-of-state contact is huge. Um, it's a really, really big aspect. So see if you can find somebody that you guys can use as your point of contact just in case there's a problem. Um, what's not on here is we also have uh, what's called safeandwell.org. We started that right after the Boston bombings, again, because those phone lines were going down and people couldn't kind of connect with one another um, and get reunited. So um, safeandwell.org is the website. And what you can do is go on the website and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm John Doe, I live at this address, yes, I was involved in the incident, and um, I am safe, I am not injured, I am, you can click a series of buttons, I'm staying with a friend, I'm staying with a family member, etc., etc., you can kind of pick, pick what applies to you, and then you can also say, okay, here's, you know, I'm staying with Aunt Sally, here's Aunt Sally's address, here's how you can get a hold of me, etc., etc., you plug that into the computer system and then your family member that lives in you know, Virginia that's like, oh gosh, I heard there was a fire in Colorado and I don't know if it's affecting my family or not, uh, can go to the website and they can say, you know, well, I know John Doe lives, uh, you know, I've got his address from the last time I sent a Christmas card. So you plug in the address and it can pull up, yes, I'm safe, I'm staying with Aunt Sally, here's how to get a hold of me. So that's a way to reconnect with your family as well. So it's not here on this slide, but that is another thing just started doing. It's a really cool asset. So make a plan. So we talked about out-of-state contacts right here, uh, methods of communication, text messaging, and then also ICE. Um, do you guys have ICE on your phones? Are you familiar with what that is? In case of emergency. Mm -hmm. Yep, ICE is case of emergency. Some phones have it as its own category, so when uh, somebody turns on your phone, there's a button for ICE right there, and, you can, and it'll pull up your emergency contact. Um, some don't, so if you put ICE in front of your contact, um, then when a first responder is going through your phone, they'll look for that ICE and they'll call that person. So it's a way to have an emergency contact on hand in case of an emergency. So, um, oh, sorry. so the alert services is here. Um, that's, you can, again, you can get apps on your phone that will alert you if there's a situation in your area that you need to be aware of. Um, and then uh, evacuation plans. For these four major areas, um, the reason is because each of them are so unique. So if you have a, a fire in your area, um, there's going to be an evacuation route that the first response is going to ask you to take. They're going to sort of funnel everybody through a certain route out of the neighborhood. Um, if there's a flood, that may not be necessarily true because if those roadways are flooded, it's good to know several different ways to get out of the neighborhood just in case. Um, if there's a tornado, obviously you're going to kind of hunker down until the tornado passes and then come out of your home. Um, if there's a blizzard, you might have a shelter-in-place situation where there's no power, etc. So just kind of be thinking about what would be your back, what would you do in, a situ in those situations to accompany um, your family and be reunited and safe, and etc. Um, One thing for the smartphones, um, if you don't have ICE readily available and you have your phone password, it should be a very simple password, like one, two, three, four because a lot of times they're trained to just do the simple passwords. Mm -hmm. um, that way they can get to or all zeros or something. Yeah, all like zeros that, yeah. or one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Yep, that, that's really it, true. To keep the kids out of phone. I know. <laughs> I do too. And actually, my daughter wiped my phone because she <clears throat> coded it wrong too many times. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fun. Um, so um, I don't know how many of you are military or ex-military or have veteran status or anything like that, but if you are, there are some unique sources for um, our military and we, we can facilitate those. So you can always call the Red Cross if you need to know. But um, some of them are pretty 
Um, a lot of the military already know, but it's sort of, so this is sort of review. Um, so there's, we have our 24-hour emergency communication, um, which is our service to armed forces mission. Um, so if you are in a situation where you had to evacuate your home and maybe your soldier is deployed um, and he needs to know that you had to evacuate your home, you can call us with the SAF um, line. And that phone number is right here as 877-272-7337. 7 days a week, 24 hours a day, 3 to 65 days a year. We don't take off Christmas, you know, because you never know when an emergency is going to happen. So um, that's our emergency communication center. It helps us get mess relay messages between military families. And it can be a deployment. It could be, you know, maybe he's just out of state doing some training. You know, it, it doesn't matter. We'll get in touch with him. We have the resources to do that. Um, what we'll need from you, if you do need to get in touch with a service member, is a full name, branch of service, rank, full social security number, not the last four date of birth and his unit, um, his or her unit, if uh, necessary, um, even if they're at home or deployed. Um, here are some of the groups, so depending on uh, which branch of service that you're in, um, our Army, Navy, um, Air Force, and Marine Corps all have a version of um, a family readiness group, so basically it's like a family support unit. So it's all the wives and families of, um, and husbands. Um, Soldier, the soldiers in the unit kind of getting together and they have access to the chain of command and etc. So they can, um, if you report it to them, they can also help facilitate you getting in touch with your soldier to let them know you're okay. There's additional military sources on militaryonesource.mil, which is um, again it's one of those websites that um, I'm a military spouse, so it's one that I frequent quite often. So there's a lot of great information there. Um, so this is a little bit about what we recommend for making a plan. Um, so we have um, sort of recommended that everybody put together a blueprint of the floor plan in your home. And then create two exits out of your home um, that you can, um, that your, your family can access. And that is the case, especially for some of the younger kids. If they know that they're supposed to go downstairs and out the front door, and they get downstairs and the front door is on fire, they'll free, they freeze up, and they're, they're too scared to know, to think, to do something else. And so we recommend that you practice front door and back door. Or if you're you know, on a single floor home, maybe the front door and the window, things like that. So um, always have two exit op options for everybody in your home. And then you draw out a map that is phenomenal. Um, talk about your meeting location outside of the home. You can draw that on your map as well. So for us, it's the mailbox across the street because we have one of those community boxes. Excuse me. So um, it could be a tree. I don't recommend a tree because a tree can also catch on fire. That might not be a good idea. So, <laughs> so in this case, they said a tree. I, I just don't feel good about standing next to wood in the middle of a house fire. It's just me. So, um, and also how to use a fire extinguisher. Um, of course, this is for kids that are old enough to be able to handle that. Um, but if you have them in your home, um, make sure that everyone knows exactly how to use it, at least reading the directions. Um, if you have one that's expired, maybe you can pull that plug and let them make a mess um, outside of your shed or something, you know, so that they understand how to use it and what it, what it takes to use a fire extinguisher if they need to. Um, so when you're making your plan, make an X on your map that tells them where the meeting place is. Um, and let everybody know where your disaster kit is located in your home if they have time to grab it. In a home fire situation, we, if there is not an evacuation kit grabbing opportunity, on average you have two minutes or less to get out of your home before the fire overtakes. So we don't want your family saying, oh, it was my job to get the go kit, and they're rummaging through a closet trying to find that go kit when the house is burning down. We want everybody out of the home first, then you call 911, then you reunite with your family, then you worry about pets and everything else. But our main focus is to get everybody out of the home as quickly as possible. So, um, so yes, you want to know where your disaster kit is, but in a home fire situation, just emphasize that that kit doesn't matter. The Red Cross will show up to every single house fire that happens, and we will provide you everything that you need so um, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so make sure you're getting in contact with your in-state and out-of-state contact if you feel like you need to. Um, and then talk with your neighbors. Okay, this is our plan. We've asked if our kids could come to your front porch in order to be reunited. Um, I just want you to know that. And if you guys 
you need that help from me, et cetera, et cetera, network with your neighbors and find out what's going on in your area. If you know that your neighbor has an elderly person living in their home and you see the whole family come outside but not that elderly person and maybe the family is more concerned with what's going on here and they're not thinking about that, you know, you can be an advocate for your neighbors. So it's important to network and work together to, um, to generate preparedness in your whole area. Um, so we suggest that you practice once a month and that you practice with realistic scenarios and check your smoke detectors when you practice. Once a month is pretty, um, it's a lot. And I don't think that it has to happen once a month, but we always recommend maybe every six months or so. Do it at least once. Um, do two run throughs, one with the first exit option, one with the second exit option. There's always a button on your smoke alarm. You can push that button, it'll set off the alarm. Um, you know, try it in the middle of the night. Try it and during the day. Um, my kids are so, um, they're such heavy sleepers that they don't hear the smoke alarm in the middle of the night. And so we set it off one night to try to test them and they all slept right through it. So that's a problem. So that's something I wouldn't have known if I didn't try that. So um, we started going through it during the day so they'd recognize the sound of the alarm. And by doing it during the day, when they were sleeping, that we just pushed that alarm button again and it woke them up because they knew what that sound meant and their brain sort of translated that into an emergency. Um, so it's important that you do go through it a few times and understand what you might be facing if, if the alarm does go off. So realistic scenarios, so you want to talk about, okay, if it's a home fire, you know, um, you can see the mom and the son down there on the floor um, and she's recommending that you test the door, test it with the back of your hand, not with the front of your hand, that's a, uh, something kind of new. Um, crawling, let's get down low and go, go, go is kind of what they teach in schools now. So um, staying out of the smoke and crawling through and, and then of course stop, drop and roll. Um, what we found is that a lot of kids um, in that elementary school range, they know stop, drop and roll, but they don't know when to use it. So if you say, hey, there's a fire downstairs, your smoke alarm goes off, what do you do? They say, stop, drop and roll. And it's like, no, you want to get out of the house. <laughs> You know, so they don't understand that that's like when, if you get caught on fire, you know, if, if that kind of thing. So it's important to not only, you know, share that information, but make sure they understand what context to use. Um, and then, of course, checking your smoke detectors, making sure that they're not expired. Um, most smoke detectors have a little, you twist it, you pull it off the wall, um, and you can look on the back and it'll tell you an expiration date. Check that, make sure that it's still accurate. Um, put it back on your wall, and, of course, your batteries, if you need to replace those. Um, so our last thing is be informed. Um, so this is how you'll find out if there is an emergency. So these are all of the radio stations. I, um, I like to highlight the AM radio because the frequency is easier to catch in the middle of down the lines and things like that. A lot of people don't think about the AM. So AM 740 is one and there's another one. Um, oh, there it is, 1240. KRDO has one. So, um, and those are obviously 24 hours. It's a great place to get information. If you have a hand crank radio, you don't need electricity to get in that information. Um, and of course, I think all of us were probably glued to the television when we were watching Bob Force to while the can happen. So, those are great places. Here's the, here's the apps. I thought the slide would be on there. So, here's some of the apps that we have there's a first aid, or team volunteer, earthquake, hurricane, tornado, and wildfire. Or just some of them. So you can, that's what the app looks like when it's sitting on your phone, and you can grab whichever ones you feel like are necessary, um, and it'll again walk you through um, you know, what you need to do before, during, and after one of those events, and give you alerts and all kinds of great info. Um, so the other thing we always recommend is volunteerism. I'm, uh, I've been a volunteer for the American Red Cross for about 18 months now. I started right in the middle of the Black Forest fire. Uh, and I love it. It's really great, and it has taught me so much. It's really made me ask those hard questions about well, what would I do if I was evacuated? My parents were evacuated in Walnut Canyon, and we happened to have a family member in town who had a car, and uh, my parents had two cars, and my sister had a car, my brother had a car, I had a car, my husband had a car. So we had like six or seven cars there, and we just started throwing the whole house into their cars. And we didn't really know what we were taking with us. And we were thinking, well, if the home burns down, do I have my pictures? Do I have my snowboard? Do I have my, you know, where's the dog? You know, you kind of just throw everything into the car, and it's really impractical. Number one, we now have a caravan of eight cars trying to get out of our room and, and 
there are really two ways to get out of our Fremen, and there's about 4,000, 4, 5,000 people trying to do the same thing. So we've created a bigger problem for everyone else. Number two, we didn't need all that stuff. It wasn't important. My parents were in such a hurry to grab things and get out that uh, they threw in the really important stuff first, so that put it to the back. And then they started saying, well, we've got a few minutes, let's add this, let's add that, let's add this, let's add that. And then they went to go stay with my grandparents, and they couldn't get to their toothbrush because it was way in the back of a truck, and they could reach it. So it was kind of impractical, and then nothing happened to their house. They were far enough away from the scenario. They were right at, uh, off Del Monaco, so they were right near the freeway. It didn't get that far. So now they basically have to unpack and, and rebuild their home. So it was completely impractical from beginning to end. And we learned a lot about what not to do in that situation. So when you know that everything that you need in terms of food and water and basics are all inside of a go kit, you don't have to be worrying about grabbing everything out of your cabinets. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that you can learn just by being a part of it, by doing presentations like this one and hearing people give feedback about you know, making sure your code is, is something accessible and stuff like that. So. Um, Anytime you're an advocate for volunteers and for, for preparedness, you're also learning about um, from other people what they think is necessary for that type of thing. So um, definitely help in your community. Um, learn life safety skills is another thing to recommend. See, we have for CPR first aid AED, we also do babysitter training, wilderness training, dog and cat first aid. I mentioned some of those earlier. So these are all different ways that you can take care of yourself and your family. What is AED? Huh? What is AED? AED is... I mean, what's it stand for? Oh, goodness. Uh, I mean, it doesn't mean anything to me unless I know what it stands emergency for. Emergency Defibrillator. Oh, So okay. their heart stops. Okay, got it. I've seen those kits. Yeah. yeah. They have them on in the airplane terminals and stuff yes. on the wall. Yep, okay. absolutely. Yep, it right. is. Yeah, oh, is it? Okay. Arrhythmia. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, absolutely. I was <laughs> like, oh no, top top quiz. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's and, and really, um, if you take a CPR uh, first aid AED class, we kind of combine all of them together. And they're very. If you ever do get in a situation where you need to use them, and you open up that package at the um, airport, all of the step by steps are right there. So there is. It's pretty easy. In fact, I've never actually pulled one out because they just said read the instructions. That was the advice I was given when I got CPR AED trained. So, so you don't even is, really need to read instructions. You turn it on and it tells you what to do. Yeah, step exactly. By step. Yeah, exactly. So they're pretty intuitive. Uh, they're pretty user friendly uh, across the board. So you know, you know, you don't really need training on it, but you know, just so you know, you can feel comfortable pulling that out if you're in a situation where you need to. Um, so yeah, so we offer all kinds of different first aid classes. We offer like that 101 level. We offer that 201 level. If you feel like you need to do any of that stuff, um, you can always call 1-800 Red Cross. Um, also, like I think the uh, American Heart Association does a lot of that stuff as well. Um, and there are some like wilderness and survival groups that you can really get into. Um, some of those guys are like zombie apocalypse level prepared. So <laughs> it's a little bit of like an overkill, but you can go if you need more ideas. Um, so that's pretty much it. So um, this is our website, Red Cross Network Prepare. 